I tried the softly, softly approach. Let's try something a little more direct. HBO's Chernobyl, a 3.6 a rumpkin rage. Now, HBO's Chernobyl has been praised for its excellent production values, its attention to detail, like getting the license plates on the cars correct, or the style of the glasses that people wore accurate. It's also been subject to some of the dumbest criticism on the planet, like what Mojo famously calling it inaccurate because the people in Russia didn't actually speak with English accents. Number nine, the key players had mostly British accents. False. Yeah, think. However, it's also been a little bit off on the science too. Like 15,000 out of three rumpkins off on the science. In fact, forget the 15,000 rumpkins off. It's off by a factor of a million. Yeah, that's so far off that who cares if you pronounce it correctly or not? I mean, just think about that for a second here. You know, the uh, that great point where the guy comes back, it's not 3.6 rungeons, and it's 15,000. That's only a factor of 5,000. <laughs> Those were the secretive lying commies. HBO says, hold my beer. We need to make some good drama here. Let's add three more zeros on the end of that. Because whatever. We got the license plates correct. Who cares if it's off by a factor of a million on how dangerous it could be? I mean, why not just add a few more zeros on the end of HBO? So I bust this myth that's been going around in uh, documentaries for years before it was repeated in HBO's Chernobyl that all you need to get a H-bomb explosion, a thermonuclear explosion, is to pour some nuclear waste into a swimming pool. The ensuing chain reaction could set off an explosion comparable to a gigantic atomic bomb. Our experts studied the possibility and concluded that the explosion would have had a force of three to five megatons. We estimate between two and four megatons. Minsk, which is 320 kilometers from Chernobyl, would have been raised. Everything within a 30 kilometer radius will be completely destroyed. And Europe rendered uninhabitable. This second explosion would have been accompanied by a terrible shockwave and a massive rise in radioactivity. All you need to get a H-bomb explosion, a thermonuclear explosion, is to pour some nuclear waste into a swimming pool. I mean, it's so easy. Why is Kim Jong-un and the Iranians having such a hard time making these nuclear weapons? Uh, really? Uh, so, sorry, what's, what's that? How do they actually store nuclear waste? Oh, that's right, in a swimming pool. So here I am pointing out the most egregiously wrong thing with Chernobyl. Well, everyone else is pulling out minor little details like, oh, this woman doesn't exist, or that great big evil pool of black nuclear smoke didn't exist, or the bridge of death wasn't real. And that's all fair enough. You're allowed to take a little liberty with your storytelling or the format. By Jove, love the English accents. But hey, Einstein, the elephant in the room, how do you get a four megaton nuclear explosion out of pouring the molten remnants of a hot core into some water? This was done to prevent lava-like corium seeping into the water and causing a steam explosion that could have devastated much of Europe. Let alone render great portions of Europe uninhabitable for hundreds of years. And who's calling bullshit on the most important misinformation in this uh, dramatization? No one who I've yet come across. And it's not because the facts are hard to check or anything. It's because if you want an attention-grabbing story about Chernobyl, it's got to be how dangerous it was, how insanely dangerous, how it could have killed us all. And most people who watch this dramatization will have no clue that what they're saying here is just complete and utter fantasy. I mean, you might think that no, no, people just understand that this is, this is a fiction. 
It's a fantasy. It's a, it's a dramatization. But no, people take this on board and they think that it's real. I mean, let me just give you this as an example. This is the Drinker Recommends review of Chernobyl. The second and third episodes deal with the Soviet response to the accident. The military is mobilized to tackle the disaster as the burning reactor core threatens to break through into the flooded basement and cause an even bigger explosion. Desperate measures are needed to stop it. When you've seen the terrifying results of the accident, every choice leading up to it feels so much more significant. Total disregard for safety in the control room. I mean, I'm not really one for health and safety, but if I was sitting on top of a nuclear bomb, I think I would be a little bit more careful with what I was doing against the young men who willingly go on a suicide mission into the basement to release the water trapped there. It's blackout compared to the firefighters absorbing lethal radiation to prevent an even worse explosion. And that's his comments on it. Let's scroll down to the comments below the video. This show was amazing. No filter, no bullshit. Just straight progression from start to finish with shocking revelation. We estimate between two and four megatons. Damn good. The scariest stories are the true ones. Everything within a 30 kilometer radius will be completely destroyed. And Europe rendered uninhabitable. For Belarusia and the Ukraine, impact means completely uninhabitable for a minimum of 100 years. No, the scariest bits were completely fabricated. Completely! A factor of a million fabricated. But honestly, from what I know about the disaster, I think Chernobyl tells its story without sacrificing too much historical accuracy. And just so we're clear, yeah, just because you can't smell the bullshit coming off Chernobyl, uh, that doesn't mean you can't have a sense of humour. He gripped from the first explosive episode to the final poignant scene, and it was the perfect antidote to the boring, disappointing disaster that was the final season of Game of Thrones. I mean, HBO went so over the top on the potential risks of Chernobyl. I, I'm surprised they didn't just throw it all to the wind and go in full Star Trek 6 on us. If the nuclear waste gets to the swimming pool, it could create a chain reaction that could destroy the planet. It's Praxis, sir. It's a Klingon moon. Praxis is their key energy production facility. Mr. Valtine, any more data? Yes, sir. I've confirmed the location of Praxis, but... What is it? I cannot confirm the existence of Praxis. Magnify. Computer enhancement. Praxis. What's left of it, sir? Look, if the corium got to the water, it would have likely made very little difference. You can't get a steam explosion unless you've got a sealed system. And you can't have a sealed system because you've just melted a big hole in the top of it. Now, if the corium gets to the water, it will be more like lava dripping into water. Sure, water could potentially dissolve some of the stuff. But this is in the category of making the worst nuclear disaster in history slightly worse. But worse than that, it would remove all of the drama and tension from episode two. I mean, just imagine the horror of this scene. Yeah, if the corium gets to the water, some of the radioactive stuff might dissolve as the corium cools down in the water. Well, we should probably drain the water, right? Okay, well, send some guys down to drain the water. And then, after the mission, they can live happily ever after, like they did. No megaton explosions, no contaminating the whole of Europe for hundreds of years, no pointless scaremongering about nuclear power, no pimping disinformation that most people will actually believe. So in Chernobyl terms, if the Corium gets to the water, not great, not terrible, but certainly not rendering Europe uninhabitable for hundreds of years. Hell, most of the uranium that was in the core when it melted, it's guess where? It's still there. It's cooled down and it's solidified now. But you know where that uranium was before they put it in the core? In the ground. We mined the stuff out of the ground where it's been there as a mineral probably for the best part of a billion years. I know, because I actually went and dug up some uranium ore from the mine that built the US's first nuclear weapon. Sure, it's radioactive. You get a few centimeters away from it, it's fine. You can use it as a paperweight with no ill effects. Uranium in the world looks like this, a rock. 
And in the molten corium, after it's solidified, it looks like this. Mostly a rock. You know, it wasn't super dangerous when it was stuck in the ground where you dug it out. 16 tons of exposed uranium and plutonium. Any uranium in that mass is more or less harmless, but there is other stuff in there that makes it quite nasty. Hell, let's come back to this guy of real life law. Actually, why Chernobyl still poses a massive problem today. Repairing the sarcophagus from the inside is considered to be impossible because the radiation levels inside are still estimated to be as high as 10,000 Renchens per hour. That is enough to kill you if you step inside for just three minutes. 10,000 Rumpkins per hour and enough to kill you in three minutes. That's odd. That sounds kind of like the uh, wiki description of the elephant foot formation. Yes, yes, 10,000 wrenchins and a lethal dose in three minutes. It's all there. But that's when it was first discovered. That's not what it's like today. Actually, why Chernobyl still poses a massive problem today. So basically, after the core melted down and it dripped down into the basement, it formed this thing that looked like an elephant foot that when it was freshly formed, was screamingly radioactive. It's enough to fry any robots. The deterioration of the sarcophagus over the years since its construction threatened to release all of this poison back out into the world. No, look, this is the way that it works. When you split up a nuclei, you get some decay products. Some of those are screamingly radioactive, but if they are screamingly radioactive, that means they're not actually radioactive for that long. So take something like iodine-131. Half-life, about eight days. That means that after just one year, it's gone down in radioactivity levels by a factor of about a trillion. And after two years, there's not a single radioactive nucleus of iodine-131 left at all. It's completely gone. The flip side being, of course, that if you're exposed to the iodine-131, in a reactor after it's just melted down, it's screamingly radioactive and is one of the things that is most likely to kill you in the short term. Meanwhile, you get things like uranium, which have half-lives of billions of years. But in practice, that means that they don't give off much radiation. The bottom line being uh, that after just a year or so, you've lost a lion's share of the radiation coming off a formation like this. And in, in 30 years or so, which is how long it's been, it now got down to the point where, yes, that is the deputy director of the new entombment project having his photo taken with the elephant's foot. But just to really drive home how much disinformational bullshit there is out there on Chernobyl, because people love this elephant's foot, the Medusa formation, where just to look at it will kill you. And the elephant's foot, the most dangerous object on Earth. Oh, that looks like a good video from Fact File with over 8 million hits. I wonder what they've got to say about the uh, elephant's foot. The radioactive blob is slowly eating away at the floor that it rests on. Underneath the facility lies water. And if the elephant's foot was ever able to take a bath, another explosion would be the result. Yeah, at this point, it's a rock in someone's basement. Quite how a rock in someone's basement falling into water is going to create an even bigger explosion and somehow make that rock travel all over Europe? Somehow? Another explosion would be the result, spreading more radioactive debris across the area and spewing even more radiation into the atmosphere. It's a rock, a fairly radioactive rock. Sure, it's got a load of things like cesium and strontium in there that really do, do sort of make it the sort of thing that you don't want to be near. But other than that, as long as it's a rock in someone's basement, it's not going anywhere. And what's more, this is their fact-checked video. Their, their previous video had so many mistakes in it that they had to take it down. Unfortunately, I had to take it down. According to commenters across the world, we got so much wrong in that video that it was laughable. Look, Chernobyl was the worst nuclear disaster in history. You actually had people dying from acute radiation sickness. About 50 of them. 
about the same number of people who die from car accidents or from gunshot wounds or from secondhand smoke in America every day. Take your pick. As for the long-term effects, well, estimates range from some 4,000 to 100 odd thousand. The reason for the big spread being that the effect is so low and spread over such a large time and area that the effect is almost impossible to detect. And that's as bad as it gets with a poor reactor design that would never have been approved in the West with no secondary containment. But what about all the radiation that did come out of Chernobyl? I mean, it clearly did because it was detected all over Europe. How dangerous was that? And how can you possibly get radioactive material out from the reactor if most of it is sat there as a rock in the basement of the building? Well, those are some interesting questions that I'll address in an upcoming video. Because really, the factual accuracy is just such a backseat passenger on most of these videos on Chernobyl. And it's just infuriating to have people who have probably never even seen a Geiger counter, let alone used one, lugubriously spout out made up facts about the dangers of Chernobyl. Yeah, radioactivity is not that bad when you get a grip on it. I'm quite happy to go into areas with a hundred times background when I've got my trusty Geiger counter because I can see the hazard very easily in front of me. I mean, a hundred times background is only three times what you get on an airplane. And as long as I can see that, I'm happy. I can express my exposure in terms of hours on a plane. And yeah, if you want one of these, there's links to them in my Amazon store below. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up for factually accurate stuff on nuclear power. Subscribe and hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss out on new content. And as ever, if you really like this channel, and his battle against popular pseudoscience. You can support this channel directly through Patreon, and I'll leave the links below.